Yes, we can see. Awesome. Okay, in that case, I'll probably get started. So, uh, hello, everybody. Uh, good evening or good morning uh, to you, wherever it is you are. Uh, my name is Senkai, and I have the pleasure of being able to chat with you today about delivering arguments. Um, and so, I guess for the next sort of hour or so, I'm hoping I'm going to just chat with you about what I think is a uh, a very important, but perhaps not always fully appreciated or uh, necessarily even understood aspect of debating. And the reason why it's important, and it's, I think it's, it, it's crucial for debaters to understand how to deliver their arguments, because for all the clever ideas that you might have, if you don't present them in a way that judges are able to understand, and um, or that or, or sort of in, in a way that is organized and logical, it means that all those clever ideas may not sort of have the impact or, or, or be as clear as you as the debater want them to be. And so from my own personal experience, when I noticed that I, I did things a certain way and I, and, I, and I learned different techniques from other debaters, this is something that uh, was crucial to being able to, um, to, 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 to make sure that I did better as a speaker and it made me be a lot more persuasive, but also made me feel a lot more confident in terms of how I was presenting my arguments. So here's sort of a, a sort of hour long presentation on, on things that I've gleaned as, as, as over the course of uh, several years of debating. But also I, what I'm gonna to try to do is I'm gonna to try to give a more sort of judge's perspective on how I think these things might work and why they're going to be useful in that context. And uh, sort of throughout the way, I'm gonna to try to stop for questions uh, that people have, um, given that yeah, I think it's, I, I wanna suggest sort of practice exercises that are on. I'm probably not going to do them, be able to do them live because there's a whole bunch of things to cover, but uh, I'll, I'll try to stop and make sure that, that people are able to ask questions uh, as we're going through. So I think we'll probably get started. So here's the plan for today. So, so delivering arguments is quite a broad term. Uh, because the whole rest of the things I wanted to talk about. Uh, so, but here are some of the things that, um, that I, I'm going to cover today. Um, firstly, on style. Secondly, on structure. Thirdly, then on illustration. Fourthly, on then combining many of those previous elements into what I'm going to sort of term strategic delivery. And finally, I'm going to give some sort of tips and suggestions of future practice. And I'm going to sort of fanboy a bit about certain things I'd like from certain debaters. So, so um, this is what I'm trying to going to try to cover over the next hour. So let's start with style. And this is probably a term that I think many debaters have heard about, but not, not necessarily have a full sort of grasp of sort of what it is. So what is style? Style is, is just simply an umbrella term for just the manner in which you present your arguments. And, and the, the reason why is because um, I think what's crucial to note is that there is no one sort of optimal way necessarily to present arguments or, the, or the, because I think it's up to your individual personality. I, you can talk as fast or as slow as you want or use a wide range of sort of pitches and variations or hand gestures. But as long as they are, for, for a couple of things I'm going to lay later on, just sort of basic traits such that if they're able to be understood, the things like that, that's actually any style can be effective. And as a result, in sort of debate land, there are a wide range of different styles that people use to try to go about trying to deliver their arguments. Um, and so what it just basically encompasses is, 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 is just the presentation of these arguments, because this is the side of the debating that is, is, the, is the performance art in the sense that you're the one who's sort of delivering these arguments. So it covers things like, your rhetoric, your emphasis, your pitch, sort of your variation, but also things like how you move your hands, how you stand at the lectern. Um, obviously, not less, perhaps less applicable in online debating, but um, but still, uh, it, it's whether or not you stay at a static at a at a podium or decide to walk around. Um, and it is it's very much the performing art side of, of the skill, given uh, of the skill, given that persuasion is not just something where you have to use logic, but it's also how you conduct yourself, how you handle yourself, how you actually deliver that logic to try to go, go, go out convincing. Yes. yes. Um, what are the, I think somebody has their, their mic on it. It'd be, it'd be great if they could just mute it. Thanks. 
Thanks. Cheers. So, so that's what style is as a whole. And I think the key takeaway here is that there is a wide range and there's no one sort of objectively good style that one has to follow. But why should you care about this nonetheless, even if there is sort of no, nothing, no style that's sort of objectively good? Because it, it is something that you have to be understood by judges. And so the way you go about explaining your case needs to be, it needs, needs to be sort of relatively clear and, and it needs to be thought out because it's, it's a massive part in terms of selling your case. And this is something that I think is somewhat unappreciated, particularly in BP, given that we don't explicitly credit style unlike other formats. And so it needs to be, you need to think about how it is you're presenting arguments because that is how the judges will be crediting those different things. And so it needs to be relatively easy to follow because judges, you have to think about your average judge. Um, and even as someone who is, for example, has judged a lot, uh, like I have in sort of recent months, you know, judges are you know, quite tired and you know, uh, they, 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 they perhaps not want, might not like the motion, um, you know, being, being asked, often coerced by, by their sort of CA friends to go and judge. And so uh, they want a, a, a style that is easy to follow, that is, that is relatively easily understood. So they're able just to get down as much information as possible onto their page without having to think about it. And so thinking about what style you want to employ and what style piece best you is something that you should actively think about. And there are also times in which you might want to be sort of more emotional it, uh, because, then, because persuasion is not just a inherently rational thing because I think humans are sort of rational creatures. Um, it, is, it was how these arguments make an individual feel. And so I think judges are even sort of someone who does, you know, really is a logician, is far more likely to buy an argument that's done emotionally in a some particular context more than if it's just sort of delivered in a pan, sort of deadpan voice. So style is important because it's basically how you, it's a key part in how you go about uh, being understood by and how you go about convincing judges to give you credits for your arguments. So I guess the next question is sort of what are elements I think are good aspects in style, irrespective of the sort of kind of style that you employ. Um, so the first thing I think is that style, you need to have clarity in terms of what you're saying. What does this mean? It means that what, what you're saying, it needs to be well, it needs to be able to be understood. And this is important because uh, judges have a limited ability to sort of not only listen to things, but also they need things like the ability to be able to process mentally what you're saying, because uh, I've often uh, a time found uh, many debaters either speak at extremely fast or, or they trip over words such that it sort of then interrupts my thinking process. So I'm trying to assess how persuasive an argument is as a judge. So this is doing things such as uh, either um, slowing down if you're speaking really, really fast, or it's doing things such as reducing crutch words and uncontrolled pauses. And I'm going to suggest sort of ways that you as a speaker can try to fix these things as you go uh, uh, sort of through practice exercises later on. But the first thing that you need to be, uh, that I think all good styles, irrespective of the speed, the pitch, the tone, whatever, is that they need to be clear and in, in that you need as a debater to be understood. The second thing is I think it's often useful to emphasize certain key words or in order to highlight to judges sort of key aspects in your arguments. So this is things such as highlighting different mechanisms or saying the impact of this, or this is important. So if you notice how I try to emphasize those particular sort of key phrases, because judges are going to be on the hunt for those key ideas, i.e. what is the mechanism for this argument? What is the claim of this argument? What, what are the impacts of, of what this person is saying? So if you can say, look, the impact of this is blah, and you sort of try to emphasize that, the judge is gonna go, it's gonna you know, wake up from their slumber or they're going to, they're gonna you know, try to listen extra keenly because you've emphasized that particular sort of uh, area uh, in, in, your, in your argument. The next aspect I think is having good control over how you're saying things. Uh, this is this, so this links in sort of with the crutch words and uncontrolled pauses, but you need to have good control to be able to 
do many of these things, i.e. the ability to speed up, to slow down, to emphasize certain things, um, and to be able to control not only things like your body language or when you're emphasizing certain words. So, so uh, a lot of speaking itself needs to be delivered in a, in a, in a you have to have control over what it is and how it is you're saying things and it comes to practice. And the last thing to say is I think you want to employ emotion so to appeal to pathos, but only when it's appropriate. So, so if the motion is something that is quite sort of emotionally taxing and, and quite, uh, and it's something that sort of describes suffering or pain or things like that, that might be an appropriate point to talk about those things in a emotive way. Uh, but it might not be as useful for say, talking about sort of like an economics motion and when you're describing sort of currency fluctuations. So it, it requires sort of subjective uh, thought on when to employ this because I think that it's best used when to heighten certain arguments to make them seem extra important, but that obviously it can't be at a level 10 all the time. So here are just some suggestions, good style, but note it's not about how, sort of what accent you speak in. It's not about even sort of what pace you speak in or, uh, or the pitch of your voice or how your voice sounds. It's all about aspects that you as a speaker, irrespective of, of your background, can control and to learn how to practice. And the key thing is just to be able to think like a judge, to think, what do you think the judge would like? Uh, what's going to be make, basically, what's going to make the job easiest for the judge who is tired, who has perhaps had relatively little sleep, has a, you know, a paper due the next day. If you make life as easy for them as possible, they will be very happy. And finally, here are a couple of suggestions on how to develop your style. And I'm going to probably cover this sort of later on into uh, the chat um, about so, sort of certain speakers that I think are, are really good for various different styles that I think people can watch and, and learn from. But I think the, the key thing to how to develop your style is, is that, is that, is that just try, try different styles out. So try speaking faster in a sort of pro-am session or in a practice spar. Try speaking slower. Um, and, um, and over the course of time, I think you'll find one that, that speaks to you or matches your personality. So, so for me, I tend to, uh, I, uh, my, my favorite debaters uh, are um, some of the ones from 2017. Uh, so some of the top speakers uh, have quite, I, I know fairly well, and although some, some, of the, some of the individuals who I admire the most, and, and just as a person, I try to be, relatively methodical about things. And so for me, I tend to find that I, I try, try, try to speak slower and try to uh, emphasize certain things more than others. And so that style speaks to me. Whereas there are other speakers who speak a lot faster than I do, who speak with a lot more emotion and, and, uh, and are able to say a lot more things than I can. Um, and that works for them and that speaks to their personality. Um, but the other thing is, I think, uh, is that a way that you can then develop this, and I'm going to talk about this sort of later on towards the end of the chat, that you can watch other speakers and you can replicate them and you can repeat the same arguments in different ways. It's like an actor sort of playing a part using different emotions and using different facets of the personality. So I think basically the, the, the more of the story is, is that the way to develop your style is just to try a bunch out, see what speaks to you. And once you find it, Practice it, hone it, and you can watch other speakers who have a relatively similar style to pick up certain things and traits that they do. Um, cool. <clears throat> so before I move on and to have a chat about structure, does anybody have any questions on sort of style and the things I sort of touched upon earlier? Nope? Okay, cool. Uh, well, I guess we're going to move on. So let's have a chat about structure. So Let's say you've had, you know, you, you've developed your style, you, you know how it is you're going to go about speaking. How should you go about structuring arguments? And I think, so what is structure and, and why should we care? So structure is essentially how your speech is organized and, and how it's then delivered. So this is, so, and the reason why this is important is because I think presenting any logical reasoning is going to require many different steps in order to 
present an argument. I think as you as as you know, and you sort of get better at debating, your arguments become more complex. They often involve multiple different steps or stages, and they might be sort of competing parallel. Well, not competing, but sort of parallel chains of logic that sort of inter that act at the same time or they interact with each other. And so it's often very important to be able to separate those things out. And so, and the reason why in debating is vertically important is because judges need a relatively clear roadmap to follow for the reason I talked about previously. They want to have a very clear idea of where your argument is going and the reasons why it is you believe it's going where it's going. And I think the, the key fact is, is that in deliberation, so, so after the, the debate has finished and the judges, if there's a panel, go off to, to, to sort of decide who's won, they only have about two minutes to decide, uh, even if that, two minutes to decide the debate. Uh, this is a, in their heads internal, and then they have a chat about it. But you have two minutes to identify out of four different teams, and you know, after those uh, sort of 48, 48, 50 minutes, to find the key contributions of each individual team and then assess them. And that isn't a lot of time, and judges might be quite tired, the debate might have been complex and messy. And so having very clear organized structure and to walk the judge how you get to your contributions is going to be a really important way of making it far more likely that in those two minutes, they'll be able, the judge is able to point out and say, yo, closing opposition here wins, they beat out closing government for three reasons. And but so what I'm going to cover here is I'm not going, I'm not going to go into the individual speeches structures because I think this is something you hopefully know or that there are other resources out there to do. But what I'm going to do in the next sort of the next section is I want to talk about different ways that you can inject more organization into your speech such that you're far more likely to go about convincing a judge and and make and making it more likely that a judge is going to be able to follow your arguments. So. Uh, here's sort of like a general sort of recap of sort of argumentative structure. So I think that probably you all should know that largely arguments generally come from a claim and then the explanations of why something is true, impacts of that, and then why those impacts are important. And even now within why true, there might be a bunch of different reasons why that is. So there'll be sort of up to, you know, three, four, five reasons, different mechanisms to explain why it is that that claim is true. And so a key part of, I think, moving away from sort of basic debating to getting to more intermediary levels is when you start using organization because it makes your speeches a lot more structured, easier to follow, and it also makes them seem much more sort of intellectually rigorous because you have many different reasons for them. So I think the two key aspects to how you inject organization into your speech. The first is having things like signposting phrases. So these are things like, in, uh, in closing government, we're going to have two unique extensions, A and B. Moving on to my second argument. And the conclusion of this is blah. So this is, this is what are signposting phrases. These are things that tell the judge where you're at in the speech but also where it is that you're going with the speech. So this is, for example, at the, at the start of your speech saying, here are the arguments that we're going to present as a team, and here's how we think we're going to get there. Or this is things like, so after you've given several reasons why you think the argument is true, you're saying, now let's move on to why we, a discussion of why we think this is important. So this is basically walking a judge through the sort of logical, sort of chronological progression of how your argument is, is going. And that's really important because otherwise the judge can get often lost. And if they don't know where you're going or the sort of the momentum of your speech or argument, it's very easy for them to switch off. And, but if you guide them along using these phrases, and it can also be even simple things, like sort of things like, you know, their form, furthermore, uh, to conclude, things that you would use like in a basic essay, uh, even like sort of at high school level, these are things that can make it a judge far easier and far more likely just to stay with you in the course of that journey of you presenting that argument. The second aspect is using numbers. So if you've noticed, I've already started trying to do this as I talk in daily parlance, but it's things like saying, I have three reasons why this is true. Reason number one is X. Reason number two is Y. Reason number three is Z. 
or things that have two important impacts. So, so it, by, it's, by using numbers, it makes it a lot easier for a judge to be able to get what it is you're saying onto their sort of judging notes because it, it makes it easier for them because it, 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 it's, it's very easy to see the logical progression of what you're saying, but it's also then easy to write things in shorthand. So, so as you, if you do any judging, you'll notice that when somebody says three reasons, you can then say, you know, one, two, three on your little sheet, and then you can write those things down. It makes it a lot easier for them. And then in the deliberation, when they're talking with other panelists, they can go and say, look, I think that opening opposition had three reasons to explain why this claim is true. And it's very easy for them to be able to identify and to then follow the chain of progression in terms of what they're saying. So, and I genuinely think is that when debaters start using numbers, start using signposting phrases, doing these basic things really consistently quite well, that is when they move to the next level of starting to be able to access more complex arguments and to be able to start to persuade uh, a lot more effectively. <clears throat> the third tip I'd have is about answering questions in the middle of your speech. So uh, what does this look like? Um, in fact, uh, that's that not exactly what I did. Um, so um, it's asking yourself questions and answering them in the middle of your speech. So this is asking, for example, at the uh, sort of to the end, if you say a whole bunch of reasons why something is true, then you want to ask the question of, what does this mean? This means that something else. Uh, why should you care? Uh, here are a couple of reasons. Well, why does this happen? And see, we're going to provide three new mechanisms. Uh, and this is actually, uh, if you notice, a lot of debaters will do this. And the reason why is because uh, these questions are things that they probably would have asked them, that, that they would have asked themselves in prep time. And I think as hopefully you'll discover, a lot of the actual speech itself is just a regurgitation and organization and synthesis of what's been said in prep time. And so if you, you can often go back and recall what it is that you should be doing in your speech and the things that you wanted to set out to prove as a team, if it is you ask yourselves these questions. So uh, and sort of why, what, why is this important? What, what is our burden on today's side? And then if you answer that question, it forces you to then give the reasons why uh, you thought about this in, the, in prep time. Um, and so that's another way of sort of injecting a bit of organization and structure because these questions force you to do the things that you were meant to do in your speech. <clears throat> the final thing I think I want to say on structure is that a key part, and if anything, I think if anything in terms of the structure section, if the only thing you take away is this, this is where I'd be totally very happy, which is that claims should be impact oriented and have explicit impacts because they highlight to a judge uh, what it is your contribution is going to be. So how do I explain this? So I think, imagine the motion is this house will pay elected politicians the GDP per capita of the country. A non-impact oriented claim would be something like, our first argument is about the economy. So, but the problem is here that the judge doesn't know what the argument is about. So, Sure, it's about the economy, but I don't know what changes. Is the economy going to get better? Is it going to get worse? And how does it change? So instead, I think it was I'm set this one more effective, is what's having called an impact-oriented claim. So something like saying, our first argument is that this motion encourages politicians to pass policies that benefit the economy. So if you notice, if the argument is, a, is, is the same. It's, it's about the economy. But the second impact-oriented claim tells you what the impact is going to be. I, there's going to be some benefit to the economy, but also how a sort of outline of how you get there because the promotion encourages politicians to pass policies. And the reason why this is important is because it, it, it gives the judge a logical roadmap for how, for, for, for how, for how you go, really what your contribution is. And so it means that in the, in the course of the debate and in the deliberation, they can instantly identify what things you bring and why those things are sort of comparative benefits or harms, which is what you need to do if you're on whatever side of the motion you're on. And so having claims that are impact oriented and give a sort of outline for how a mechanism for how you get there and what you're going to set up to prove is a really key important way of doing this. Um, let me just check for time how we're doing because um, I guess if there aren't any questions, we could even perhaps try some where people can suggest some in, in the chat. Um, so 
I guess before I move on to sort of illustration, does anybody have any questions on anything I've covered with sort of structure thus far? Or potentially, and something is a bit more interesting. Um, could anybody suggest another, a, a, any other impact oriented claims that one could make about this motion? Anybody want to give, give it a go? Just a sec. Uh, does anybody have any suggestions? Pop it in the chat if you if you think if you have, have any. So if you are on, like, say, the proposition, the, the opening government, what's another claim that you could make, and how could you make it impact oriented? Anyone? Okay, uh, in that case, I'll, I'll give a suggestion. So um, a non impact oriented claim is that, you know, our second argument is going to be on, um, on, on recruitment. An impact oriented claim of that, of that argument would be something like, our second argument is that the motion uh, encourages talented individuals to, to go into politics and use their talents for civic and public good, uh, for example, uh, or, 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 or it disincentivizes talented individuals from, from going into politics and using them for, for the sort of civic good. Um, that's probably what I would talk about if I was trying to make that claim impact oriented because it demonstrates that the impact is gonna be you're gonna get worse quality politicians perhaps as a result of the motion um, if you're on opposition. Uh, excellent, uh, does anybody have any questions before we move on? Okay, so the third thing I want to talk about in terms of delivering arguments. Oh, hang on, we have somebody in chat. Just give me a second. Yeah, exactly. So, so uh, that that would be a good signposting uh, thing uh, from debate Asana. Yes. Uh, yeah, that that, that that would be a that would be a good signposting to demonstrate how it is that a what it is you're going to be proving from a particular team because it highlights the key contributions that you're about to make. So yes, that's probably what I would say as a, as a good example. Um, perfect. In that case, I'm going to, um, oh yeah, so our argument symbols are more representative of how the people of the country are doing. Um, so again, that, that, so with that particular claim, it's, it's slightly unclear as to, at least for me, what you think the impact of that argument is going to be. So what is the impact of there being more rep uh, that individuals will be more representative? Perhaps you want to say something like, we think that the policy is going to make politicians more relatable to individuals because, uh, uh, because, they, 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 because of the perception they now have a stake in the game or something like that. So you want to provide the impact of that, but also a, a sort of overview of the mechanism of how you get there. Um, yeah. But perhaps we can come back to this later on. Um, but yeah, I think, I think people hopefully get the general idea. So um, let's continue on to illustration, which is, I think, the, the, the next step in terms of delivering arguments. So what is illustration and why is it that we should care about this? So this is asking you a very specific question. So this is the question of what does this look like? And this is useful because of, for a multitude of reasons. First of all, this forces you to think about why something, and once you explain how something looks like, it doubles up on explanation of why something is true, but also why it's important, because I, the, both of the sort of core tenets of trying to prove persuasiveness. And the reason why is because it, it makes your argument seem a hell of a lot more plausible to the average individual person, and it injects clarity in your argument because it demonstrates very clearly how you think that this argument or, or, or uh, mechanism or impact actually sort of plays out in the real world and how it's likely to function. That illustration can make things seem, the impact seem a lot more widespread because you ground it in a actual context. 
And often these, intu uh, these, often these illustrations play to people's intuitions and emotions. And so this is something that the best debaters do exceedingly well. They're able to point out to illustrate how they're, at least they tell a story of how it is that the argument is like to work. So not only do they give the logic and the reasoning, but they can point to, to say how that logic and reasoning is gonna operate in the real world if the motion was actually coming to pass. And I'm gonna give a couple of examples of how this actually happens. So I think that the most basic way that you can start doing this is by giving illustration as impacts. So this is like at the conclusion, towards the conclusion of your argument, you wanna say something like, what does this look like? Or this means that. And then for example, then give an illustration of what it is you think that impact actually looks like for people on the ground. So then let's go back to the, this has to pay politicians the media national wage debate. Um, the impacts on the proposition could be something like that politicians are going to pass more economically friendly policies that they're far more willing to work with the other party. This is going to lead to more growth, more economic activity, more taxes to fund public services. And so making your impacts very, very explicit and by also describing the behavior of individuals and their likelihood to do something. And, if, and the more minute detail that you can go into, that's going to make your argument a lot more persuasive because it makes the outcomes of what you're saying and the reasoning seem a lot more plausible and a lot more specific in the context of the motion. So one way to easily start doing this is to say, what, what do we think the impact of this argument looks like? We think it looks like uh, people on the ground, uh, I mean, we think this is likely to, to say, for example, have more trust in politicians when they, because when they see them on the television screen, they think that they are the average individual because they're just being paid the average wage. And so it means that they're far more likely to turn up at the voting, uh, the, the voting booth when they don't see politicians as this elite, foreign, rich group, things like that. So just telling a story, telling a story of how you think the mechanisms or the, sorry, the, the, sorry, the impacts of what it is that you're saying, how they are likely to fit in the world. But illustration can also focus on actual sort of analysis, <coughs> excuse me, which is that um, they can be used to show how mechanisms work. And in a recent debate that I watched, there was a really, really good example of how this could actually come about. So the motion in context was this has to make charity status dependent on evidence-based assessment um, of uh, sort of the, the uh, so the organization's utilities is basically like what's effective altruism. And the closing opposition ran this argument and their claim was that, uh, the, the claim essentially was that it's impossible to gather enough data. And so we should not have sort of an independent board of experts decide which charity should be sort of allowed to exist. And the mechanism for doing so, and the logic was that there's something called an attribution problem. And this is it being quite hard to point to which specific charity generated a good outcome because often there's a complex set of chains of events that have to occur in order for a good outcome to happen. And the illustration that the speaker used was like this. I said that to illustrate, there's like, here's how we think we'll illustrate this mechanism. Or what, is, what does, does this look like? This looks like, Somebody, uh, so let's say, for example, somebody is, uh, uh, is inclined to harm themselves uh, and one day sees an advert on a bus saying that, you know, that you shouldn't harm yourself, or that, you know, there's hope for the future and that, uh, you know, sees a relatively hopeful advertisement on the bus or on the, two, uh, on the train uh, or on a boat or something. And then the next day, this individual then sees a helpline on Facebook run by another charity because often charities tend to be quite, uh, uh, have like specific, the specific things that charities tend to do because of economies of scale and because they tend to do sort of one thing well. And so, and then after they call that helpline, they then, that's one instance of sort of self-harm that is averted. But the problem is that those are different charities. And even if you recognize that they're different charities, you don't know the relative impact in terms of the generation of that outcome. 
And so this is why you should not ban them. Because if you get rid of one charity that, if you get rid of one link in that chain, perhaps it's the case that none of the other things fall. So for example, if there wasn't for the helpline, that person might have harmed themselves. Or without seeing an avid on the bus, they wouldn't have called the helpline. So it's very difficult to be able to ascertain, to give the, the correct credit to those charities. And so the illustration here was the example of how somebody might go about interacting with these charities. Because the mechanism just by itself, it, it's logical, but it, it's a little bit abstract in the sense that if you don't have a clear idea of how this is going to operate, it's, it's much more or less persuasive because you as a judge don't know about if this is realistic. But providing the, the illustration of somebody who might want to self-harm and telling, telling the judges how this is likely to work, that then acted as a very powerful mechanism to explain how the, the team and speaker in, in, uh, in, uh, in particular thought that this mechanism would actually operate in the real world. And so illustration is the sort of next frontier of debating for the for novice debaters, which is that now you're able to go about explaining complex mechanisms by grounding them in real world examples. And this is something that I think, this is what I think I learned the most when I listen to other individuals because they can bring their own unique life experiences and things that they know and apply them to illustrations to tell us how it is that they're, the things are, that they say are likely to happen in the real world. Okay. So that sort of wraps up my sort of spiel on sort of illustration and why I think it's important in terms of delivering arguments. And we can talk about later about how we can might be able to generate some of those. But does anybody have any questions on illustrations and what they are and why they're also quite important to delivery? Yeah, does we have a question? How do you avoid arguing by example or illustration? So what you want to do is combine, combine them. So you don't want to argue by example because the reason why is because somebody can just point and say, ah, that's just one example, right? But that's why you want to give the mechanism or the sort of the reasoning behind why that example is likely to happen in a large majority of cases. And, and then you then want to then back that up by the illustration. So in that particular example, if we just go back. Oh, so the mechanism was that the attribution problem, it wasn't that there was, there was a, a, an attribution problem for that particular, so just in the case of individuals who might self-harm, it's just there was an attribution problem in general in, in society of it being very difficult to give credit to charities where credit was due. Uh, because many things are complex. And this was then used as in one example of it. And then I think the judges then have the intuition this could apply to a large, many different set of circumstances. Obviously within the speech, there's a trade-off and sort of time and content, right? So if you can give an example that's relatively persuasive and it's probably broadly applicable to many other cases, this is something that I think is sufficient to be able to illustrate what the mechanism actually looks like. And is also analysis because for the reasons I described earlier, it makes the argument seem a lot more true, a lot more important and a lot more plausible. So while yes, you want to avoid arguing by example illustration, that's why you want to give the reasoning for what something happens. The next level after you give the reasoning is to give an illustration of how you think the reasoning actually operates in the real world in a context that is suited to the motion and is one that's likely to apply in a large number of cases. Does that answer their question? Gotcha. And if there are any other questions, are there, are there any other questions before I move on? Nope. Okay, cool. In that case, let's keep going. Next, I want to talk about, so combining all the previous things that we've chatted about into something that's called strategic delivery. And this is where you actually start to weaponize a lot of the things I talked about earlier and allow them to help you win debates and go about persuading a panel to give you know, uh, the win to you over relative teams. Because obviously BP debating is about, is, is a, uh, it's about 
it, it's comparative debating in the sense that it's, it's not just about taking the first in the debate, you have to beat other teams as well. So how can you use delivery to really aid you in that pursuit of being able to beat other teams? Well, the first, I think, most obvious thing is that in BP, we have introductions. We have you know, often speakers will spend a good 30, 40 seconds of their speech explaining it is what they do and what their content is going to, how the content is going to fit into the motion. And I actually do think these are things that are very useful because they allow you to introduce yourself. They allow you to set the scene of what your team is going to bring into the debate. They allow you to wake up the judge to say that your team is the one who's arriving into the scene and is going to do great things and is going to really set out their stall in terms of what the content is you're going to bring. So introductions are, are quite useful. I'm probably not going to describe what these introductions contain because I think it's dependent, highly dependent on the motion and where you are and how the debate has actually proceeded. But they can be emotive if the motion allows for it. But, and also you, you want to make these introductions as memorable as possible, sort of in a good way, by having things like catchphrases or so key lines that are, about, are the highlight what your team's contribution is to the Bay as a whole. And I think the key way to do this is that you have to plan them out in advance before you actually give your speech. Uh, you have to plan out the introduction. So what I usually do is that the introductions are the only place in my speeches and my, in my prep time where I will actually write out word by word what it is that I'm going to say. Rest of the rest of my notes and all the things I'm talking about there, it's obviously all relative in shorthand, they're relatively sort of spaced out. But in the introduction, I put on a separate sheet of paper and I write out word for word what I'm gonna say. And that's important because it, 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 it's, it's going to be your first contribution to the round. It's going to be set out your stage for what it is you're going to be saying. And so having it making sure it's very clear and that you're carefully choosing the words you're going to say, so to make it as clear, as efficacious, and as memorable as possible, that is something that you then, I think, are best achieved if you plan out in advance. I, I think a less effective introductions are one that is done spontaneously. You want to make sure that this is pre-planned in advance and to suit the context of what's happened in the round. So introductions is a very good way of immediately setting yourself apart from other teams by uh, making them as memorable and as clear as possible of what it is you're going to be bringing to the debate as a team. And this leads me very nicely on into the second aspect of weaponizing delivery, which is that in the closing half, it's, it's, this is particularly important. The reason why is because, and there's a video that I might be able to try to get into the uh, get into the sort of YouTube comments that I might be able to, to send to people after uh, my talk, which is that uh, a, 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 uh, a well-known debater who, who happened to coach me, um, basically his philosophy on closing half, which I also tend to agree with uh, quite naturally, um, is that it's all about selling your extension. And the reason why you have to sell it like a salesman, quite literally, is because judges are always going to be inherently skeptical of what it is you're going to be bringing because opening half has already said a bunch of things. Perhaps they're quite clever. And then you in closing, you, there's an extra burden on you to be creative, to be new, uh, to have something that's more important. So they're going to be a bit skeptical about whether what you're actually bringing is going to be new and important. It's also later into the debate, so they might be a bit more tired. Uh, the debate might have been a bit messy or just a bit bad. And so they're like, eh, we're not going to spend much of the closing teams here. So what you need to do in closing is to sell your extension. And the way you do that is trying to be as memorable as possible and try to be as clear as possible relative to other teams. And a really key way to do that is if your delivery, it is by giving clear style. It is by giving organized structure, but it's also things like crucially highlighting what your contribution is going to be. And so it's using phrases, things like, the problem with the top half in, the, in your introduction is blah. Or and also saying certain key phrases like, our unique contribution from closing government is gonna be this. Or opening government said this, but we don't think they go so far as to demonstrate why this outcome is likely, or it's going to apply to this particular group that we think is really important. So, it's all about selling your extension and differentiating yourself. And so 
in your speech and in prep time, you should always be asked to have the question of sort of why is this unique and better than opening government? And you then should then inject that particular question into your speech. So if you're at the end of your argument, you want to say, why is this stuff that we told you better or more unique than what's come before in the debate? Here are a couple of reasons why. And that to make sure that you're doing the work that you need to do in closing government by selling your extension, by making sure that it's as memorable and specific as possible. And that is far more likely for the judge to be able to listen to you and to buy into those arguments. So, and I think as a philosophy, it's something that's really important to bear in mind when you're thinking about if you're an extension, how it is you're going to place better relative to other teams. And this is where I think planned introductions can be a really, really awesome way to just frame out a lot of different other teams by pointing out things that they've missed in the debate or what you think that your contribution is going to be. And finally, so part of the things that I've talked about earlier, which is that you have to, it's doing things like impacting claims and then giving conclusions to arguments. Um, so often in debating, people will present a whole just matter dump, a lot of different mechanisms, a lot of different impacts and things that are sort of happening. At the end. But as a judge, it's so often nice to hear a conclusion to an argument. And this is important because it sums up all the like past two or three minutes of content that you've been talking about. And this is literally just saying towards the end of, end of your argument, like, what is the conclusion of this argument? The conclusion is that, uh, for example, in the politicians one, that, that we're going to get far more economic growth when politicians are incentivized to improve their own salaries by increasing the, 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 the median average wage. And so you want to basically do the same thing as doing in your claim and linking what your argument is back to the original claim that you were making because it summarizes in the judge what they should, the conclusion they should draw away, from the, what is the take home message from what it is that all the last few minutes of what you're saying. And that makes it really clear because they then are, need to weigh those impacts against other teams and the two minutes that they have to decide the call this makes it the issue speech a lot more memorable at the point when you very give very clear conclusions to what it is that you're saying. And often it's also useful if you if you're a speaker who speaks quite fast, it's often useful to slow down in this instance. So you speak quite fast and then and then say, the conclusion of this argument is X. What I want you as a panel to draw away from this is Y. And just by slowing down or by changing your pitch that makes the judges clue in because it, they know this is a different section of your speech and one that they and one that they know you as a speaker are trying to sell to them. So that's why having good control of how you're saying things is really important in terms of actually delivering that speech and that argument. And also it just, it just makes the scene speech seem a lot more structured and easier to remember. If you also just sort of very clearly impact those claims, and you know, have three impacts, and also then tie that back to the claim that you were making. So what I would advise people to do is that after you give an argument, towards the end of your argument, you wanna, give, you wanna say, the conclusion of this argument is this, and here's why we think that is important. Which means that you get sort of nicely round out the argument, it signals that you're ending it, and what the judges should draw away from the last two or three minutes of your speech. It's a signposting mechanism, but one that is really important for judges to be able to understand to be able to assess what your contribution is. So before I move on to sort of tips and suggestions on how to develop all the previous things I've just talked about, does anybody have any questions on um, sort of the more strategic implications of how to deliver arguments? No? Okay, so let's, let's keep going. So here are my sort of tips and sort of future suggestions on how I think speakers might be able to go about uh, developing some of the things that we've talked about. And obviously a lot of it takes practice. A lot of it is a lot of failure, a lot of you know, trial and error. But here are some of the ways I think you can make the process a bit easier for yourself. Um, so here are some tips on actually delivering a speech in a round that I have found useful over my course of debating in the last five years. The first thing is, is it's often going to be really crucial to remain calm and collected, right? I mean, the debating is a very stressful activity. 
And so if there are any ways that you can make it a bit less stressful for yourself, it's often going to be useful in making sure that you have the optimal control of what it is that you're saying. So I think this, this is, these are things like taking some time before the start of your speech and planning out in your head what the first 10 seconds of your speech is going to be like. So often, even online debating, as you get up, you have a chance to sort of shuffle around your notes and take a moment, take a, take, take a breath, take a pause. And then as you're doing that, plan out how the first 10 seconds of your speech is going to go. What words are you going to be saying? How are you going to be saying them? What pitch am I going to be speaking at? What pace am I going to be speaking at? And then you then deliver those lines. And that's really awesome because it gives you confidence that the rest of the speech is going to go well, but also make sure you don't say anything sort of stupid or dumb though, the things that you don't want to say in those first 10 seconds, because the, and that's really important because those are the first 10 seconds that you're introducing yourself to the judge and the judge is going to be paying attention to. So it's also going to be just useful in a sense that you can breathe and say, ah, I have the confidence to do this, let's go do it. Second thing is, is that I think there is an upper limit in terms of how fast speakers should speak. That's to say, there are some speakers who speak really fast or some who speak quite slow, but there is a point where I personally think that speaking too fast is a, it, it, it hinders from what it is you're saying. Because sure, you're getting more content, but the judges do not have the time to be able to process what it is you're actually saying, then it's, 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 it's redundant because it, it's not going to be able to add any new material and makes their job a lot harder. So this is where you have to access some discretion. This is where we have to listen to feedback. But I often find that there's some speakers speak too fast. So I, it's not that I can't comprehend what they're saying. It's just I don't have the time to be able to process the sort of comp the, the implications of what it is that they're saying. Uh, finally, um, I, and it's also things like uh, making sure that you're glancing down to remind uh, what you're sort of looking at, but also just you will do want to look up and try to maintain eye contact with the audience of what you're saying. Final step I want to say is that if you find that you're in the middle of speaking and then you, you lose control of what it is you're saying, for example, if you start, say, start stuttering or you start saying, oh, mm, 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 something like that, what's, what you can do is this. So you can just pause and then just recommence what it is that you're saying. So if you notice that I just took a small pause there as I was in between certain words. And that's actually, if you, if you, I hope you notice this, it wasn't something that was unnatural at all. And this is actually something that's totally okay. And what it allows you to do in that sort of couple, you know, maybe up to a second, is that it allows you to regain control of what it is you're saying and avoid all the ums and the stutterings that happened. So a little story about this is that um, I used to have a massive problem with stuttering and losing control over my speech and my arguments. And it really hindered my ability to be understood. I, it blocked my clarity. And so what my coach did at the time was that at, at that particular point juncture, he made me repeat my speech wherever I made the, uh, whenever I, I said um or I stuttered and until I started using these pauses instead. So I wouldn't have to repeat my speech. And he made me do this in front of 40 people on one of the, sort of the opening days of our society, uh, sort of a recruitment season. It was one of the most embarrassing things I've ever done. It was, it was quite emotionally traumatic and I, I don't recommend anybody do it. I remember I sort of shedding a tear, sort of turning my head away and then sort of an embarrassment. But the more of the story is, is that if you practice this and perhaps maybe a less public fashion, but if you practice this and use the technique of pauses to regain control of your speech, this is a really important and very, very effective way of making sure that you're understood and that you as a speaker have control of what it is that you're saying. Second tip, which is that you should watch some videos. Uh, so once you think about you have some style or things like that, style that you like, it's going to be really awesome to be able to learn from other people who have a relatively similar style. So here are some suggestions just debate videos to watch. The first is the Austral's 2018 final, uh, which is between Macquarie and Sydney on a, a really cool motion. And all the speakers in them have relatively different styles, but because the topic is quite emotive, they often use very good illustrations, they use quite emotive language, and um, it's just a really good 
it's just a really good debate to watch, but also it's one in which I think all the different speakers use, deliver arguments in a way that maximizes their persuasion because they have chosen the delivery very carefully in regards to the topic. I'm not going to spoil it for you, but it's a really good one to watch. Second video is, uh, I put it in the link. I'm hopefully going to try to be able to share these slides later on, which is that this is a PM by Louis Collier, who was an ex-Oxford debater. And he, in the speech, is, it just really gives really, really good structure of this, in which he walks the judge through this particular argument. He uses lots of numbers. He asks himself questions. And just a really good illustration um, of all the things that I've talked about previously. Last thing I want to talk about here is I'm going to do a bit of sort of fanboying in the sort of last sort of 10 minutes we have left, which is that once you identify a particular uh, sort of style that you like, there are many different speakers that, that, in, that, sort of, uh, that you might be able to learn from with that particular style. So I'm just going to go through uh, in fact, yeah, a bunch of these names um, just to talk about why, what their style is and why I like them. So let's just start with like, there are some speakers who speak a bit faster and a bit more content heavy. Um, and so some really good people to watch here are like, is like Enting, who is uh, just a hero. Um, her speaking delivery is one that is quite fast. And I remember she was at least uh, one of the posts, you know, seriously posting, she was uh, a long time, she, she was concerned about her accent. But I don't think that detracted from the fact that she spoke quite quickly and she was still very much understood. It's very easy to understand what it is she's saying because she structures it in a very clear, logical way. She gives really good illustrations. Uh, she's just fantastic to watch. Um, MDG, if you can find uh, his videos, are classic. He speaks also quite fast. Amrit, who's one of the fellow CAs of the tournament, is an absolute legend and the current Austral's champion. She speaks awfully fast, but she does so in a way that is just quite funny, is very rhetorical. And so it keeps, what it does, it keeps the judges and people watching engaged. And it means that they then take down all her contributions. And so that's really awesome. Uh, Tin is also a worthy respected European debater. He also speaks quite fast, just is able to get out a lot of material. And the way that he makes sure that you're not lost is why he uses a lot of numbers and things to illustrate uh, like the various different reasons or mechanisms of how things, things happen. A couple of more newer debaters who I think are also just brilliant. Naomi is the current uh, best speaker in North America, uh, and uh, she got there by iron manning the competition, which is pretty amazing. She says a lot of things in her speech. There, she goes through many different mechanisms, but the way that she does them is that she, again, uses lots of numbers, very careful at organizing things, and she also asks herself questions of the key things that she needs to do in the round in order to go about winning. So she is a fantastic person to watch if you can find her videos. Final person to mention on the sort of more faster, more content heavy side is Ellen Thurlow, who is the current Austral's champion and is a first speaker. Um, she is just fantastic. Uh, watching the, 20, the 2020 Austral's finals, just she kills it basically. She wins it out of her first speech. Um, and she is uh, immaculately clear in her delivery. And she is able to organize it very effectively using the things I talked about earlier, and is just able to get a lot of uh, things out. Uh, she's a fantastic person. I think is a role model in terms of how you want to be doing first speeches, and she's fantastic. Second category on speakers who might be slower but more word efficient. So this is a, a different style of how you can approach it. I think the ultimate individual who I point to in this category is probably Vinu Goswami who was Hart House A back in 2016. There are many videos of him in sort of the Test Worlds collection. Uh, he speaks with such clarity uh, and without speaking that fast, it's just amazing to watch. And he's able to give really key contributions within a couple sentences. It's, it's just fantastic to watch. I think Harish also fits into a similar vibe and also Tommy Pito uh, from Oxford. Uh, if you can his videos, he also just does it in a really clear, logical, structured manner and he does it really uh, without speaking that fast. Alternatively, I think Annie Williamson from Oxford uh, A from Euros 2016 is also another person that's just brilliantly, um, who doesn't speak quite that fast, but is able to just say a lot of things without saying that much. And also uh, uh, Shristi, uh, who is Best speaker in Europe, I think a couple of years ago, uh, she also speaks relatively slowly, is very rhetorical, is very awesome. Individuals who I think have really good illustration. If you want to learn about how to illustrate well, are people like Lucia, who was best speaker in Europe, uh, Tekwe, who, uh, who actually 
Kashmir, it's actually is the person who gave the example of the charity thing I talked about earlier. Um, he is probably one of the best speakers I, I know who does good illustrations and just walks you through arguments in a really clear, persuasive manner. And then there's also, of course, uh, like Milosh and, and Dan Lahav, who are just fantastic speakers in their own right, are really able to say really quite clever observations about the world to explain how it is that they're going, that the reasoning actually operates. Just amazing. They're also speakers who are more rhetorical in terms of their phrasing. And these are people like Sheng Wu uh, from Oxford back in the day. Uh, he has some really, he makes really clever arguments seem really important because he uses certain language and certain phrases that mean that you as a speaker believe that they're important. I think this is also how Chin, the current world champion also does this. And I think Chin like thinks the rating is a performance art. He, he talks about like he's his theater in terms of how he delivers arguments. And so he makes his speeches quite rhetorical. He's famous for sort of leaning into the microphone doing those sorts of things to make his speech more memorable and more persuasive. A more recent example of somebody doing that is, is uh, Dude Matt Song, who was on Team China, won with the World Schools Championships. And his speeches are often very rhetorical in terms of how he asks questions and how he tries to rebut other teams. And, it, and, he, and he often uses certain words or phrases that you might be able to glean upon to make it seem that that like other teams are what they're saying is nonsensical, but also that why it is what he's saying is, is just very intuitive. Final category that I think I want to give a special mention to is that there's some speakers who are just quite funny and they use humor as a device to be able to keep people engaged, also because they're just funny people. Prime example will probably be Ben Jackson, who is uh, one of a couple of years ago. Um, he, I remember watching his speeches and just laughing my socks off because it's really quite funny. Uh, another individual is Jamie Jackson from Shitposting Legends. Um, when he's debating, he's, he's also just quite funny. And there's also Junko, who is also just a funny, lovely individual person to know. His speeches often include sort of quite crude humor and it just really just makes it a lot more memorable. So when you're in closing half, you're like, ah, he said something quite funny. Here's what he meant by that. So what I want you to take away is that there are many different styles and all these speakers are amazing individuals who I'm just massive, huge fan of in their own right. And there's no one individual style for you to, that, 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 to follow, uh, but that what you can do is be able to learn from these individuals. And so what I suggest is, you know, Googling them or their institutional team that particular year on YouTube and finding one of their videos, chances are either it's a final or something that's been recorded and you can watch their videos and maybe you to learn from something from them and how they about, go about making their arguments. Finally, to close uh, today's uh, talk, here are some delivery exercises I think you could go about trying to do on your own to try to improve upon some of the things we talked about earlier. So the first is a, a little game called Just a Minute. And this is something I do with kids when I'm teaching. And the game is like, you want to be the first person to cross the finish line, to be speaking at the minute mark on a timer. And the way that you do so is that you speak without giving any hesitations or repetitions to a particular target word uh, or a tar target topic. And as soon as you make a hesitation or you make a repetition, somebody calls you out for it and then they get to speak. And so this forces you to think about how you choose words very carefully and to make sure that you establish control over what it is that you're saying. And so this is a very useful exercise. You don't even need to do it with another person. You can just do it yourself with a little timer. And then you can just say, uh, I want to talk about you know, economics for a minute let's just have a chat about it. And then you can just do that. And every single time you hesitate or repeat something, you then stop the timer over or something like that. This is basically this is like a non-public way of going through this sort of emotional trauma of, of, what, I, of what I was put through um, as, a, as, a, as a student, um, but by my coach. Um, but yeah. Second way is that you can then practice speeches again. So you can, let's say you, you, you really like the speech that you gave at a certain competition. What if you did that same speech, again, using the notes that you have, but in a, in using a different emotion or trying to give it in a clearer way or a more structured way? So you can practice speeches that you've given over again because you have the content in front of you. All you have to do now is, is focusing and isolating the delivery of that argument to make sure that it is the most effective. So what you can do is then just is practicing those speeches again. Final exercise, and this is a bit longer, which is that it's, it's relatively similar to the previous one, but that you can then sort of Try to have a particular target in terms of how you're going to actually uh, give emotive language. So this is like a case outline uh, from a speech at old schools 
And what you can do is say, I want to deliver this argument in a very emotive way. And then you can just try to walk yourself through them for the different reasons to suggest and, and then try to deliver it in that particular emotive way. For example, something like, you know, um, these foreign companies can only demand, can, are able to get away with forcing the governments of poor nations to subscribe to their terms. We think this is abhorrent and terrible and exploitative or something like that. So to delivering them in a much more emotive way to practice your ability to be able to do that when the motion requires it, where it would be useful in that particular debate. So um, here are a couple of suggestions for sort of um, exercises that you can do. Uh, and speakers that you can watch, and um, and I've sort of gotten my fan fanboying for the day out, out of the way. Um, and so I think that sort of wraps up the, the my talk as a whole. Um, if there are any questions, please or comments, please go ahead and and do so. And um, if you can, do sign up for the Astana uh, ADU Proams spars uh, still going on before the competition. And I hope to see uh, many of you at ADU Novices. Uh, I hope it's, I think it's going to be a good time. And thank you all for coming very much. Thank, thank you all for coming. And if you have any questions, go ahead and ask.